thanks, Nick, for the introduction. And uh, I just want to thank Dai in particular for inviting me to my first ever USAR, um, and also for everyone at Monash University for putting up with me for the past year um, and all the uh, ping pong tournaments and things like that. So uh, it's been a wonderful experience here in Australia. Uh, it's coming to an end soon. But um, anyway, I'm very grateful for all everything they've done. So um, I want to do a couple things here. First of all, I know people often ask for slides, but I've done something one better this time. Um, so if you, wanna, if you don't like to listen, uh, you can read about it on my blog, simplystatistics.org. And uh, it doesn't look like this now, but it will look like this afterwards when I click the Merge button. And so you can read my talk uh, on my blog uh, afterwards if you feel like it. So um, I kind of want to do two things today. One is just to tell a bit of a personal story. Because I've been, as Nick said, I've been using R for a while, and uh, and also to hopefully tell a story that can explain, kind of, or maybe, oh yeah, explain kind of how we're all here today and how um, we can all we can all be here today. So um, in doing so, though, I thought I would focus on a relatively straightforward question, which I, well, at least one that I used to be straightforward, I think, which is what is R. Um, so. In an earlier time, uh, when I used to teach uh, R in classes and things like that, I had a pretty simple answer, which is that, you know, duh, it's just a dialect of S, right? <laughs> what, what else do you need to know, right? So uh, <laughs> a lot has changed since then. And um, I thought it would be useful to um, maybe go to the R website, right? Because, uh, you know, if someone's looking up R, they'll probably go to the R website and see what they have to say about that. So on the R website, it says, R is a free software environment for statistical computing and graphics. Which I thought was interesting. I hadn't been to the R website in quite some time. I don't really go there ever to download the sources or anything like that. Um, so I, didn't I think this, language, this sentence has been there probably since the beginning of the website. Uh, and I thought it was interesting in the way that it was worded. Uh, by contrast, I uh, thought, well, since I'm, on the, since I'm on the web, might as well stay. Um, I went to the Tidyverse website, and their first sentence is, Tidyverse is an opinionated collection of R packages designed for data science. So I thought these two sentences uh, make for interesting tent poles, I think, for the enormous tent that is the R system. And I thought I would use them as kind of reference points for what I'm going to talk about today. So. Um, so going from there, I thought, well, I'm still on the web. I'm not going to leave, right? So um, let's see what uh, some other websites say. So this is from SAS, standardized data governance and management, extensive range of deep analytics, solutions that modernize and integrate with existing operations, deploys containers, run in a grid, drive value for analytics results. I'll tell you, that sounds like SAS to me. Uh, <laughs> uh, This is from the Stata website. Stata is the solution for your data science needs, the solution. Um, obtain and manipulate data, explore, visualize, model, make inferences, collect your results into reproducible reports. I have to say, that actually sounds pretty good. <laughs> I might use that system, actually. Uh, probably at the wrong conference. Um, OK, so anyway, that's just for reference, though. So I think any talk about R would be a little bit, or at least the kind of the, the kind of span of R over the last 20 years would be a little remiss if it didn't talk about the origins in S. And um, I'm always fascinated by kind of the development of the system and kind of where things come from and where they're going and where they've been. And, um, and unfortunately, actually, a lot of the, the documents that were written about S kind of in the early days at Bell Labs um, are not really available on the web anymore. I guess Bell Labs has kind of packed up shop and moved on. Uh, so if you want to find a lot of these documents, you kind of have to go on the Internet Archive. Uh, but they are there, and so um, that's uh, so. If you, but if you Google around, you may not be able to find them. So, I think um, one of the things that's interesting to note. So, John Chambers wrote in the evolution stages in the evolution of S, uh, the kind of audience that they were thinking about when they developed S, and he said, "We're looking for a system to support the research and substantial data analysis projects in the statistics research group at Bell Labs." Now, so just think, take that in for a second. If if you weren't a member of the statistics research group at Bell Labs in roughly 1976, then the S system wasn't designed for you. 
Um, and, and, and R, of course, inherits many things from S, and so just think about that for a second. This is a pretty small group of people. Um, they were doing data analysis there, and they had all kinds of Fortran libraries and things like that, and they wanted a system that was kind of different from that. So furthermore, he writes, that, uh, so John Chambers writes, that little or none of our analysis was standard. So flexibility and the ability to program were essential from the start. So hold in your mind flexibility and the ability to program for a, a little while. Um, and then I think he writes, what I think is the, one of the most important paragraphs about both the S and the R languages. Uh, and I, what I would characterize as the kind of defining feature of the language. So this is um, in the same document, Chambers writes, the ambiguity of the S language um, is real, and it goes to a key objective. We wanted users to be able to begin in an interactive environment where they did not consciously think of themselves as programming. Then as their needs became clear and their sophistication increased, they should be able to slide gradually into programming when the language and system aspects would become more important. So um, in, in the same document, they t he, Chambers writes a lot about how they had a lot of trouble naming the system. Like, uh, because, you know, is it, is it a statistical analysis system? Well, they couldn't name it that. It was already taken. And then uh, is it a data analysis system? Is it a statistical graphic system? You know, it's, you know, so what was this thing? And I think the trouble is this so-called ambiguity that Chambers talks about, which is the interactive environment and the programming language. So ultimately, they had a problem. They were asking themselves the question, you know, what is S? Because <laughs> you have these two things. You know, is it a floor wax or is it a dessert topping, right? So, I don't know how many Saturday Night Live fans we have out here, but um, so ultimately it seems like they, they settled on a, a quantitative programming environment, which actually has its own little kind of interesting side story. Uh, it was, I don't know, I might characterize it as the tidyverse of its day. So, um, so what I draw from this work by John Chambers uh, is what I call the user developer spectrum, or the analyst developer spectrum. And I think those were kind of, this was kind of the design requirement for the S language, right? It's got to, it's got to satisfy this whole range, okay? It's got to be usable by the whole range. Of, uh, and, um, and I think um, that is it's just a fascinating aspect, and it's always been, and I think it's, it's a kind of novel design requirement for a programming language, I think. So that's the context, that's the kind of like, the little prehistory, pre pre I guess, is what I might say. And then I, I, I want to talk a little bit about the context in which R came to be. Right, so what were the new users of R like in, say, early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s? Right, so this is from my personal experience. Uh, they were often familiar with existing packages, right? So they were using SAS, data, whatever, um, and they were already able to do data analysis. So it may be hard to believe, but data analysis occurred before, you know, 1996. Um, and, um, and so when I would go to them and say, hey, you know, I've got this new thing, it's called R, and you can analyze data. They were like, we're, we're already doing that. W what do we need this for, right? So you couldn't, that's not a, couldn't sell it that way. They had to have something else, okay? Um, that said, the opening occurred when many of these people were unsatisfied with the kind of canned analyses and procedures that, that these packages already had. Uh, and, and, the, and, bec and as a result, these packages didn't really let you modify or augment uh, their canned analyses and procedures. There was no programming language, and there wasn't a lot of flexibility. Right? So they needed flexibility. Right? So there in indicates a little opening for R. Um, a lot of these people already had backgrounds in other languages, so maybe they program in C, C++, Fortran, um, things like that. And so they were familiar with programming. And, and in particular, they really valued the idea of an open source system. There were really no open source or very few open source data analysis platforms or programming languages out there. Um, and so the idea that you have an open source system for doing data analysis is quite appealing. Um, so it's useful to just kind of go through some of the, what were, what were the existing packages at the time? Of course, you had S+, um, you had SAS, you had Stata, SPSS, popular with the e econo uh, economists. Um, the m world's most widely used data analysis package, Microsoft Excel. And um, of course, my personal favorite, one that always will have a pl special place in my heart, um, xlipstat. So, <laughs> so I, when I heard that Luke Tierney was gonna be here, I had to put that in for him. So um, anyway, it got me through graduate school. So 
what some of the key problems, and this is not an exhaustive list, were first graphics. The, the graphics in these systems were pretty poor, sometimes just a notch above you know, fancy ASCII art. Um, and uh, you didn't really have any control over the details and the design of the statistical graphics that you might be making. So the other, I, as I mentioned, it was already the flexibility. There was very little flexibility. You couldn't build custom tools. Um, and the programming languages, if they existed, were very rudimentary um, and mostly designed for kind of doing statistical calculations. So that's where we are. And into, here enters Ross Ahaka's and Robert Gentleman's paper in JCGS 1996. Uh, R, a language for data analysis and graphics. Ah, we see the words data analysis for the first time. So uh, if you haven't read this paper or if you haven't read it recently, I highly recommend it. Um, every time I read it, I get something new out of it. Um, and I think it serves in particular as a really great example of how to write a paper about software. Um, and it really kind of, well, I'll talk about what it says in a second. Um, but if you read the paper, it really looks more like this. R is language, and uh, actually data analysis and graphics isn't even mentioned in the paper. <laughs> but, but maybe that's a, that was a better title to use uh, for the journal. Um, so really the paper kind of talks about the language and why it is the way it is. Okay? And so I thought it'd be used. So oh, one lesson that they learned was that uh, despite what's been a nearly all-consuming effort, we've managed to remain on the best of terms and retain our interest in computers and computing. But to which I say, thank goodness, <laughs> because uh, if, uh, if they had lost interest in computers, uh, I think we'd all be in trouble. So I actually think it's a little useful to kind of go through the table of contents of this paper, just to see kind of what they were focused on at the time and what was really important to them in designing this language. So the, table, the first part of the paper obviously had a little introduction, and it goes right into the design issues. So the design issues, what are the design issues of the language? There's the syntax, of course, how do you use the language? Um, there's the evaluate, how things are evaluated in environments, maintaining state within functions. This is a big deal. Um, made it slightly different from the S language. Um, lazy arguments and default values, uh, which are, I think, important for writing code for data analysis, the, and, uh, which they do say. Um, and then there were implementation issues, uh, portability, so the system was really originally developed for the Mac. Um, there was a uh, kind of interesting discussion about, you know, whether it could be ported to the Intel 286 system that had a grand total of two megabytes of memory. Um, and then the implementation strategy, also a little interesting, is basically R is a scheme interpreter with a little bit of syntactic sugar on top to make it look like S. Um, so S plus scheme equals R. Uh, and then there's a long discussion about the internal structure, symbols, concells, all this kind of lispy type of stuff. Environments, vectors, and strings, how this is all working. Uh, memory management, of course, because everything had to be in memory, unlike in the S system, where everything was kind of on the disk. Um, and then timing. Is it faster than S? Of course. Any paper that has a timing section in it, it always says that their system is faster, right? So other <laughs> otherwise, there's no timing section, right? So, um, and then some conclusions. And then after the conclusions, they talk about future directions. And I, you, might, you might think about, well, what, what do you think would be the future directions at this time, in 1996, okay? Um, and uh, they're building a programming language, right? So what does a programming language need? It needs like programming language tools, right? So first of all, we need a source level debugger, uh, which we do have now. And then uh, we need a compiler, because you know, all good languages have a compiler. And, uh, and a foreign function interface, so we can talk to things like sort Fortran and C. And in the end, they have the program listing, which is, gives example programs in R. And the two functions that they give are the critical function, the heap sort function, right? often used in data analysis. Uh, <laughs> I, I, th I think of heap sort as like the computer science equivalent of the sweep operator. Uh, it's something you program once in graduate school and then you never see it again. Um, and then numerical integration, which may be a little bit closely more closely related. But. So that's the paper, okay? And um, reading through it and kind of thinking about how the system was designed at the time, and if we think about where we are on the user developer spectrum at this point. Uh, most of what was, has been built, I think, from my point of view, is clearly on the developer end of the spectrum. These are tools for people who want to build new things, right? Because, and, and my interpretation is that we had things for the data analysis side. We did not have anything for building new stuff, right? So let's focus on building new stuff, okay? Now, of course, as time goes on, people do want to, they don't want to be using five different systems, right? Especially because some of these systems cost a lot of money, right? So what about R for data analysis? So 
I thought I'd just walk through just a, a one instructive example, which I think would be ring true to a lot of people. So here's just a uh, eight rows from the air quality data set, which is the kind of environmental health version of IRIS. Um, and all I want to do is take this month variable, and I want to calculate the average of ozone in each month. Okay? So I think that's a familiar calculation for a lot of people. Um, today, you would probably do, use the dplyr package, do group by on month, and then summarize by taking the mean of ozone. And I just remove all the missing values. And that gives me a data frame or a tibble with uh, five rows in it, one for each month, and the average of ozone in each of those months in parts per billion. Um, so now let's uh, travel back in time. This is my travel back in time sequence. <laughs> okay. Uh, and to say, let's say 2001, because when I started we're roughly, or actually this could have been like 2010 probably, but, um, and we're using the aggregate function to do the same thing. So we give it the data frame, first argument, and then a list of the factors, on the splitting factors. So I want to split on month. And I want to take the mean, and I, I, I remove the missing values. And it gives me a data frame that kind of looks like this. Not exactly the same. It takes the mean of everything in this case. But um, I could have selected out the ozone variable. So this is what I was teaching to students in 2001, 2002. Um, and so, so many questions, right? <laughs> uh, what are the square brackets for? Well, they're subsetting a data frame, right? Uh, what is this list thing? Oh, uh, list is a type of R object. What is this mean function? Why is it just sitting there all by itself? Well, it's, you know, it's being passed as an argument uh, to, to aggregate, and it's you know, kind of like an internal L apply where the function is being applied to subsets of the data frame. So, of course, you know, what's L apply? Um, and is na.rm equals true an argument to the aggregate function? Well, no, it's an argument to the mean function, but it's being passed to mean via the three dots <laughs> the argument of aggregate. So, you know, everyone knows what that means, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, these are first-year graduate students uh, that I'm talking to. So um, I think... A number of people probably in this room have had a version of this conversation, or if they were teaching R or in the early days, um, which is essentially like, I know you want to analyze some data, but first we have to have a discussion about different kinds of R objects, subset operators, functions, and functional mapping, and variable argument lists. <laughs> right? Because, you know, everyone wants to know about that, right? <laughs> Now, to be fair, in the very early days of my experience, this actually was not that big of an issue because people did want to know this stuff because they wanted to program, right? And so, yeah, we got data analysis for free on top of that once we knew how to use the programming language. So, but the, uh, at the end of the day, you get flexibility and the ability to program because, you know, ultimately, you, you don't just, you know... <laughs> It kind of has like a kind of a frequentist feel to me. You know, I don't, care about, I don't care about giving you the mean. I care about giving you a system that can take a lot of means, right? And so um, that's where we kind of, I often left off um, starting people off in R. So moving on from there, um, I want to talk more about R as a programming language. Because I think at this point still, the value proposition of R is that it gives you flexibility and the ability to program. So what do you do if that's the value proposition? Well, you kind of double down on it. Right? So first things, a, a number of things happened over the kind of course of 10 years. We have developed an S4, the S4 formal class method system for object-oriented programming, because every cool language has a system for object-oriented programming. Right? Remember Java, remember C++. Um, and so we have that now, because the S3 system was a little ad hoc. Uh, localization, internationalization, and translation, a big uh, addition to R over this period. Uh, namespaces for R packages, comp a compiler for R code. Um, these are all just a few of the, development, the uh, developments that occurred in the R language. Now, all these things, I think, addressed key issues and key perhaps deficiencies in the R programming language relative to other programming languages that are out there. Right? So people were coming in from Perl, they were coming in from C, they were coming in from Fortran, and where all those other languages had things like, well, not all of them, but they had many things like this. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, the new features you know, were not really kind of the analyst-facing or user-facing types of features. These were developer-facing features that allowed you to build better R packages, uh, better R code, more efficient R code um, uh, for, for other people. Okay? 
Now, of course, the one exception I would say in that, in that what, short little list is the localization and interna internationalization effort that went through uh, that really brought, kind of made R a global package. Uh, and I think it, uh, that was, a, at the time, and maybe even now, a major differentiator uh, for, for the R system. So, um, but at the end of the day, you know, I had nothing to do, I had nothing, I can't help the sad bear. <laughs> he just wants to take group means. <laughs> Um, so, at this point, um, it, it, many technological developments over time follow a pattern where the things that are considered the very best and very important things, the things that make these things great, uh, are great up until the point that it makes them bad, right? So the strengths can be strengths up until the points that they're weaknesses, right? And it's sometimes difficult to na nail down when that point is until very long after the fact. Um, and so I think it's, it's at, at various points in time in the history of R, it's very useful to think about, well, what are the strengths, what are the things that we truly value about the system? And is it possible that at some point that we will consider these ultimate liabilities uh, of the system, okay? So at this point, I would argue that one of the things that occurs, the system wasn't changed. I mean, the system was changing, but the system was what it was. But one thing that was changing, of course, is, the, is that the population of users is getting much bigger and much more diverse. So we have these original new users that are being joined by many other new users, okay? And um, in, in, uh, again, in, in my experience over time, a lot of these new users were not familiar with all these other data analysis packages. They hadn't used SAS. They, had, they definitely hadn't used S+. Uh, they hadn't used Stata. They were, they were coming in fresh. Right? They were seeing this as a system for doing data analysis. Um, it did not have experience with other programming languages, so they weren't C programmers or Fortran programmers or whatever it was. Um, and they were likely encountering data analysis and statistics for the first time, so they were seeing R and data analysis for the first time. It wasn't, that, it wasn't like they've been doing data analysis for a long time and now they're using R. Um, so all of this is kind of coming together similarly. So when you put this all together, these new new users, they see flexibility and the ability to program, which is what the value proposition was. And well, flexibility, you know, looks a lot like complexity, right? If you just squint in your eyes a little bit. And the ability to program looks a lot like the requirement for programming, right? Um, so, so now we're in a place where the same system is viewed by two different, in very different ways by different people, okay? Uh, and I think, um, I got this next quote from uh, Rick Becker, who I guess gave a talk at 2016 USAR. Um, he wrote a very nice article, which I recommend everyone read, called The Brief History of S. Um, and it really rings true today, <laughs> I have to say. It's amazing how things don't change that much. But he wrote, you know, it was a realization that routine data analysis should not require writing Fortran programs that really got S going. <laughs> okay, change a few words there, and very little, um, you, could, you could use that sentence today. So, or you could use that sentence a couple of years ago. So, that, so this is kind of what brings me to um, the tidyverse. And I think, um, I just want to br briefly mention some features of the tidyverse, which I think are, have been really important to the people on the other end of this long spectrum of the kind of analyst developer spectrum. And, and I think when you, when you look at the, when you look at the kind of, some of these things, they, they, you can see why they, they seem a little strange. So the first is the kind of the generous use of non-standard evaluation, right? The, the fact that it's called non-standard evaluation gives you a little warning there. Um, but ultimately, this is kind of more logical for a lot of people who just want to analyze data and who want to, who are just want to, you know, they're coming in fresh. And the fact of the matter is, this is kind of how like all the other systems worked anyway, right? So um, they just, you know, they weren't programming languages, so they kind of worked in this way. They didn't call it non-standard evaluation, but that's kind of how they worked. Like you type in the variable name and it calculates the mean, and that's it. So you have a system, you have a statement like this, which everybody now recognizes, and but it's like, well, where does the month variable come from? Where does the ozone variable come from? And of course, they all come from this air quality data set, and that's a non-standard evaluation, but. It totally makes sense, and if you were to show someone this code who hadn't really programmed in R and say, well, what's the output of this code? I, I, it's fairly predictable, and, and it kind of makes sense, and this is often what a lot of other statistical packages look like. This is how you type in the code for you know, something like Stata or SAS. So, um, so this is a lot more familiar, even though it's what we would I call non-standard evaluation. Um, some other features, another feature, of course, is the tidy data as a unifying principle. 
Um, so you have the observations in the rows, you've got the variables on the columns. Uh, and this is a very important, well, first it was very important to put a name to the idea. Um, and second, um, as a unifying principle, it allows a dramatic reduction in complexity. Um, and um, it, it allows for a simple kind of format to kind of to produce a, a limited set of tools, but then give you a trem tremendous amount of flexibility. So some other features that I think are worth going through are the modularity, so building things from simple parts, you know, connecting them with clear interfaces that, uh, that are, that are well-defined. Clarity, so code is for developers, it's not for machines, right? Um, the idea of composition, so you're going to be putting things together, connecting them with things like pipes. Um, transparency, so tools should be written for visibility and discoverability, right? It's not some obscure function names. Um, least surprise, I think, is very interesting because it, it takes the user's expectations into account. What are these people expecting? What are they, where are they coming from? And how we build upon that rather than work against it. Um, and then repair, so, so code should fail in a manner that's easy to diagnose because, you know, uh, cryptic error messages are not great for new users. Now, I pulled a little fast one on you because this is actually not the tidyverse philosophy. Um, it's actually the Unix philosophy. Uh, but it, word for word, it pretty much works uh, uh, the same. And uh, I think that'll be interesting uh, in a second when we think about the future. So Tidyverse does have a few extra things. First is the reuse of existing data structures. So the favoring of the rectangular data is, could be thought of as a limitation, right? Because there's more than just rectangular data out there. Some formats are more suited for other kinds of data. I'm thinking maybe spatial data, but there could be other things. Um, so even if the rectangular data is a little ill-fitting, Ill -fitting, it's worth it to standardize on it for the sake of reduced complexity. And this is an example of kind of favoring the implementation simplicity over the interface simplicity. So the other version of this is something like an object-oriented system where you have a complex object, right, a, a complex data format that's abstracted away for the user. So the user just calls one function and everything just kind of happens, right? Here, we don't have that. We have a very simple data format, but then we have to pipe together a whole bunch of functions to do some sort of operation, right? So the interface is more complicated, but the implementation is much simpler. Um, the idea of embracing functional programming is not, is probably the least kind of controversial in some sense. Functional programming has been in R since day one, so uh, there's nothing really new there. Um, but the idea here is in contrast to many other programming languages, especially early on, especially C, where, where the natural paradigm is to write loops and things like that. Um, the idea here is you don't want to write loops, and also, just like C, you don't want to have side effects because uh, it's easier to reason about code where there's no side effects, there's no thing over here that's being modified by code over here. So, and to the extent that there's any unwritten rule of the tidyverse, it seems like it would be don't use S4 classes and methods. <laughs> so, um, I think if I were to summarize the whole philosophy here um, in a single phrase, it would be basically that worse is better, right? So uh, this is not like a, some weird insult or something like that. This is a very common phenomenon for technologies that arise to serve kind of a different population, right? Uh, in the business world, they call it disruption. But here, I don't know what we call it. So, um, but the, per the point is that by limiting the complexity of the system, um, you've ha it, it makes it better for a a different group of people, right? And that different group of people may not, uh, was in some sense overserved by having a, a very powerful programming language offered to them without the ability to just kind of take the mean within, a couple, within groups. And so, um, actually, it's a very interesting essay. This is really uh, by Richard Gabriel. It's really more talking about Unix, but uh, the idea is the same. And so, um, so now with this system and many other packages, uh, oh, sorry. We have, we've kind of gone to the other end of the spectrum here. We have a interface for the analysts, for the users who want to analyze data. Um, and, and we cover, I think, a much wider range of this spectrum. Um, now, of course, time always marches forward. And so the question, a question comes up in terms of what's going to happen uh, in the future. All these users and analysts are coming in, all these new, new, new users that are coming in. They're going to want to program one day. They're going to grow up, right? Um, and what are they going to do? Well, so on the one hand, you can say, well, we already have a programming language, right? It was there from the beginning. But that's like saying, 
you know, I want more power in my laptop, and so, but you can say, oh, well, just go use a mainframe, you know, <laughs> or go, go use a desktop. I don't want to use a desktop. I want, to use, I want more power in my laptop, right? And so um, how things will go back the other way, it'll be interesting to see. I think there's a lot of development in this direction already, um, and it's interesting to see that. Um, so I think that's, but that's for the future, right? And that's for, not only for, for the future time, but for future new users, right? So the new users 10 years from now, they're going to look even more different. Right? They're going to have very different expectations. So, um, so I think it's always good, again, to think about what are the strengths of the system at, at a given time and what are, and could those strengths ever, ever become weaknesses? Right? Um, and so I just talk about four things I think are, are worth looking, forward to, uh, looking for kind of in the future. Okay? Uh, All right, I have to get closer, or not. All right, so the first is this kind of Unix slash tidyverse philosophy. So I think the, it's a very attractive philosophy for many reasons. The idea of modularity, um, composition, clear interfaces, it's hard to argue against, I think. Um, but I think it, it's, it might be instructive to ask yourself, where is Unix today, All right? And in some sense, it's kind of everywhere and nowhere, right? Unix, everyone's carrying Unix in their pocket. Uh, well, maybe not Stefan. I know he's using a phone from like 2005. But, uh, <laughs> but most of us are carrying Unix in our pockets. Most of us are accessing servers uh, that are running Unix in some format. Um, so Unix is everywhere, but the Unix principles have been smothered a little bit, right? Because if you think about what's on this phone, what makes this phone so great? It's the apps, right? Uh, the apps don't follow the Unix philosophy, right? Those are just huge masses of code that get installed on your system. And if you have two apps that use the same library, then you just have two copies of that library sitting there, right? So um, it's a little bit different. These are monolithic things. And I think there was anyone who's ever administered a Unix system knows that modularity is great until you actually have to use it, right? And so there are downsides to this kind of philosophy depending on the setting and depending on the platform that you're using it, and depending on what users are expecting from the device or the platform or whatever. So, uh, so, so Unix is, is, it is everywhere, but we've managed to build on top of it. Even on the server side, you have things like containerization, which is kind of like the same idea. We use Unix there, but we have these containers on top to kind of take all that other stuff away. Um, so, so there's that. Um, and pr maybe on a slightly darker note, but I don't mean to get too dark, um, it's interesting to know kind of where Bell Labs is now, actually, uh, or where perhaps it isn't. And so nothing lasts forever in the business world, so, um, but it will be interesting to kind of keep track of how things go. Uh, the second is the non, the, so as I said, the generous non -standard use of non-standard evaluation. That's great for users. I think it's uh, definitely a much simpler interface for doing data analysis. Um, but as Thomas Lumley mentioned in his talk yesterday, it can be a little bit weird for programmers, right? And especially if anyone, if you've ever taught a class where people want to say they want it, they've had this dplyr pipeline and they want to put it in a function, well, there's lots of surprises there for you. Um, and so now and there's, uh, there's a lot of work going into this too. You've got like the Arlang package, a lot of other things to allow for a programming infrastructure built around kind of this non-standard evaluation framework. So, but that's something to look out for in the future in terms of whether the new users of the future accept it or not. The, sec the third thing is, is a little different. It's an issue of discoverability. So I think the biggest complaint for R in 2000, 2001 was that there's no resources, right? There's no books. There's no manual. There's nothing, right? The, S uh, well, no, the Stata, you know, SAS had like a nine volume manual. It was like a library shelf that you just have, right? Um, for R, you had like the introduction to R PDF. You had, you know, John Fox's book. You had Modern Applied Statistics with S. And th that was it, right? There's no resources, right? So now you fast forward to today, and there's resources everywhere, right? Uh, and so just like with many aspects of the internet, discoverability is an issue, right? So if I write an R package or I write a document, how does it get discovered by other people? It's not immediately clear. And um, who do I call for that? But the, and of course, the problem is that if there is one person to call for that, that's also a problem, right? Because if Google controls all discovery or Facebook just controls all discovery or whatever it is, then that can also be a problem, right? So this is a very difficult issue, I think. Um, and the last issue I think I want to mention is language safety. So there's kind of two ways to think about safety in R. Uh, the first, I think, is in the traditional programming language sense. So there's been a very big move 
uh, in programming languages in general towards safety um, so that people don't shoot themselves in the foot, they don't do things that are insecure. Um, and I think there's perhaps something that could be done there with R, I don't know what. Um, the other motion, notion of safety, though, is kind of data analytic safety. Um, so the idea is that there are lots of things that you can do, easy mistakes that you can make when analyzing data. And uh, to the extent that we can use the system to prevent those kinds of mistakes, um, that may be a good thing. So uh, I don't know how, but, but on the other hand, making a system safer is sometimes at odds with making a system very flexible. And so um, there may be some balance that needs to be struck there in the future, especially as more and more people are analyzing data every day. They don't all have PhDs in statistics. They don't even have maybe degrees in statistics. And so how do these people are going to analyze data? What resources are we going to give to them? And what guidance can we give to them? And in, and in the context of this, the guidance has to be coded in the software. So uh, just four things to think about for the future. So, I, so the, this has failed. I'll just do that. So. Um, I w last thing I want to talk about is selling R. So I don't mean selling it commercially. I just mean like selling it to your, the person sitting next to you who hasn't used R before or whatever. Not in this conference, obviously. Uh, but um, and I talked, it kind of contrasts how we used to sell it and how we maybe sell it now. Um, so in the 2001 edition of this, obviously free was a big selling point. Um, open source was a very big selling point. Um, the graphics system was a no-brainer. It was very easy to show that these graphics were better than any other graphics in any other system. Um, and the presence of the programming language was very attractive, right? So people were attracted to that, I think, to be able to, be able to do new things, to build new tools. Fast forwarding uh, to th 2018, I think a big thing that's happened between, now, between then and now is this notion of reproducibility, reporting, automation, and how that has been made a lot easier uh, in R, especially with packages like, well, originally with like S-Weave, um, and then now with EYCS um, knitter package. Um, that's a very very uh, nice thing to do uh, in R, and it's something that uh, it's very easy to kind of convince someone that's a good idea, right? Um, uh, interestingly, graphics still remains at the top of the list, I think. The graphics have gotten even better, uh, and uh, it's still very competitive uh, to other packages. Um, and especially with, you know, Thomas' talk yesterday with GG Animate, I think these are always getting uh, better over time, so that, that's something to stick with, I think. Third thing, of course, now I think is the R packages in the community, which has grown so big and diverse. You know, we've got 10,000 packages on CRAN, we've uh, almost 1,000, I think, on Bioconductor, and then who knows how many out there on GitHub and wherever. Um, there's packages for everything, it's, uh, it's, and the community built around those packages and the people who use those packages is really phenomenal, and uh, it's really great now. So, being, so kind of becoming part of that community is a real benefit. Last thing I'll mention is R, the RStudio IDE. I think the RStudio IDE is really, has been really helpful for teaching R to new users. Having a dedicated IDE uh, for a programming language I think is really critical. It helped me learn C++, um, and, and I think it's useful for people to have a dedicated IDE for learning R. Uh, and I think RStudio is a great job. And RStudio the IDE is great, and RStudio the company, I think, has made a lot of contributions to, to R in general. Um, we had an unconference uh, in Melbourne back in October, where we had a little informal kind of lunch discussion about this topic, and I just thought I'd report a couple of things that people mentioned uh, at that unconference. The first was that someone mentioned bioconductors. So if you're doing things like high throughput biology or something other domain specific thing, uh, it's, this is an incom incomparable kind of uh, resource uh, and collection of tools for two people uh, working in that area. Um, the idea of using R end to end, so, the, so you can read in the data, wrangle the data, uh, do some exploratory analysis, model it, uh, do some predictions maybe, build an interface, build a shiny app, all in the same system is kind of attractive. Now, you may not want to do that at the end of the day, but it's, gr it's at least great for a prototyping type of system. Um, and uh, so I think the, the idea that you can use R for all these activities is really attractive, and it definitely wasn't true uh, 20 years ago. Um, for the spreadsheet audience, introducing the dplyr or something similar uh, is, can be an eye-opener in terms of efficiency, in terms of reproducibility, uh, and so that's one way to kind of bring people over. Um, the transferability of skills is related to the open source nature of it, so if you're learning R in one company and you have to move to a different company, you don't have to worry about that company having a license or a contract with the software. R is available everywhere. Uh, you may need to negotiate <laughs> with some people at the new company if they don't use R, but at least the kind of availability of it is, um, is greater. 
Someone said, just show people all the jobs that require our skills and the salaries attached to them, uh, which I thought was, was definitely a way to, <laughs> to convince some people to learn R. Um, and I think the, the fact that it's free really still st is important. Um, licenses for MATLAB and SAS haven't gotten any cheaper. Uh, and so um, the fact that it's free gives, it a gives a lot of people access to a system that they wouldn't normally have access to. So uh, I thought I'd end on this last quote which, uh, from F. Scott Fitzgerald. says, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still ret retain the ability to function. Um, and I think um, when it comes to the, what I mentioned as the user developer spectrum, uh, I think at this point in time we've covered the widest expanse of this than we, as we've ever had. Right? Um, and I think it's, it's uh, I think it's, so I think in some ways the audience or the population of people using R is, is mo more diverse than it's ever been, um, but, but the system is kind of more capable than it's ever been. And, um, and I think as we move into the future, um, I'm very excited about the language kind of evolving uh, and about new people coming into the system, about seeing what these new people are going to need and what they're going to want. Um, and how we might evolve the system to kind of meet that need. Um, I think periodically we have to think to ourselves, you know, we ought about what are the strengths of the system, uh, what are the good things that we really value, and we want to make sure that we don't, that those things that we value, those things that we consider to be strengths, don't also become the things that prevent us from making changes uh, and, and kind of evolving the system towards whatever new population kind of enters our community. So, uh, so with that, I think I'm just very excited about the future um, of R, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Roger. That was, that was really great. Um, we have time for some questions, so um, just please raise your hand. We have some microphones over here and here. I was, I was told by Dai I was supposed to wake people up in this keynote, and maybe I failed. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, Roger. That was really, that was really well put with the historic perspective, picking up where Rich Becker was two years ago and, and all that. And I think it's really good to come back to the starting point that is meant to be as a system for doing data analysis, sliding into programming, because I have the feeling we're focusing too much right now on making the data analysis easy at the potential cost of making the programming harder and less sliding. What are your views on that? I mean, are we focusing the former at the expense of the other? I mean, are we moving somewhere on that continuum right now? I have the feeling we do. And I'm not sure it's a good thing. Yeah, I, so mean, I, I fundamentally believe I'm still here because you know, I'm a programmer when I'm a data analyst. I can't think about doing data analysis without being a programmer because you know, and, and you made all these references to how we got here in the late 90s, myself too, in 2000, and were able to write packages. We didn't write those packages to populate CRAN. We wrote those packages to get our problems solved. I agree. And the modularity just led to there being packages. So we were always analysts and programmers, but of course now the universe has grown and there are a million more people, and it's just, you know, where do we want to be on the continuum, and where will we maybe be in five years on that continuum? But this, it was really excellent exposition. Thanks again. Yeah, uh, I think there was a question in there somewhere in terms of where we where we <laughs> where we are. Yeah. Yeah. So is there a cost to the kind of? Well, first of all, I'm not sure I do see a trade-off. I think that's maybe one interesting aspect about the R language in terms of I think other languages maybe couldn't have handled this kind of change. Um, and the idea that we could have these systems kind of layered on top of each other that are accessible to both is, is interesting, I think, at the least. Um, that said, I think, I, I, I personally think that um, there was a gap in the original development of R, but I think the reason is that gap was there is because nobody cared. Right? I think the idea that you needed a simpler system for analyzing data, I think, was just not relevant maybe in the 90s. And I think we, like, I know from personal experience, I wanted to build new tools. Like, I wanted to build, you know, new statistical methods, and uh, that was an absolute priority for me. And it's not like because I wasn't analyzing data. I was, I, I was building them for myself. I, I hear what you're saying. Um, but, um, but the priority was being able to build these new tools. And I think 
Uh, if you look at, I, you know, I didn't go to USAR 2005, but I, I, my sense of it, that was quite a bit more kind of academic in that sense uh, than the conference is now. Uh, and so the diversity of the population is just su is such that you've got, I mean, if the system is to survive, I think it's got to, it's got to span uh, the diversity of the users. Um, so I, I, is there some, if, have we overcorrected or something like that? I don't know. I mean, um, I think, but that said, things are always moving. And, and, I, and the hope is that we don't stick, we don't stay here, right? If we stay here, then it's over, right? <laughs> for sure. But that's true for any language, I think. Um, I think the pendulum has to go back and forth. Um, and we have to kind of keep moving. Hi, thanks for a terrific talk. So my question is about something that you alluded to in the talk already, uh, that these users on this end of the spectrum would want to grow up and go there and use, take their tools with them. You might already be aware that there's considerable debate on different forums, Twitter, Stack Overflow, etc., about using Tidyverse tools for package development, and I was wondering if you have a strong opinion on that. I, I, I don't have a strong opinion about that. I just, I don't, I haven't seen it enough to have a strong opinion about it. Um, I think the development is actively underway, so it may be premature, I think, to, to kind of to talk about it. And I think it will be interesting to see how, I mean, I think this goes a little bit to what Dirk was saying, you know, it'll be interesting to see how things evolve and whether we can, uh, whether the community can sustain multiple ways of programming. Um, I think that it can, uh, but that's just my opinion. Uh, thanks, Roger. Um, in terms of keeping on moving, does, look, do you think our studio has too much power and could could restrict that ability to swing back and forth. I know, yeah, I'll leave it there. <laughs> so I'm not an expert in kind of like the evolution of open source communities. Um, I don't think, uh, I think, you know, I think the other day we had a question about the idea that, the, that you know, that free software is free. Uh, and I think uh, it's, you know, I think today, after 20 some years of just open source software in general, I think there's a sense that you know, free software isn't actually free. Um, it's uh, someone pays for it. Um, and I think we have to be cognizant of that fact. Um, and so, cause, so, so there's that. Second, I think, um, I think our studio has, you know, have made, has made a very good commitment to open source. All of their contributions have been available to us. We use them, we use them because they're good, not because we've been forced to. Um, and so it's, um, so there's that. And I think if they were to disappear off the map right now, we would still have all their tools. Um, and so that's a fundamental difference from say, I think you know, it, it, 20 years ago you had com other companies that really weren't doing this. Um, and there was the embrace and extend kind of philosophy uh, that I think doesn't exist today, right? For, at least not for R. Um, that said, I think there are other issues involved though. And I think maybe what you're getting at is a little bit is the discoverability issue. Um, and in terms of who controls that and who controls what, the what kind of what shapes the community. Uh, I don't know what to do about that though. I mean, that's, so that's uh, maybe an issue in every kind of community, I think. Uh, so on the same theme about, as an, as an educator, how do we go about teaching people to use R with this more tidyverse user-oriented thing in a way that makes it easier for them to slide into programming? Um, <laughs> that's a good question. I don't know. Uh, I think we're kind of on the cusp of that right now. And so I think people are going to have to try different ways. Um, it's so, so maybe it's a little bit of a mess now, I think, uh, but it will sort, I think it will sort out over time. I don't have a good recommendation for that. I'm going to be dealing with that myself in like a month. Uh, <laughs> and so um, I'll, maybe I'll get back to you the next time. Um, <laughs> I, one thing I wanted to say, I think there's this extent to which I think R is considered by other program, other people from other programming languages as like a bit of an incoherent mess. Um, and I think one of the things to remember is that it's a language for data analysis. 
And if you think that the language is a little incoherent, a little confusing, a bit of a maze, well, then all I have to say is welcome to data analysis, right? <laughs> so, um, so there's an extent to which I think the language kind of reflects the difficulty and the very heterogeneous nature of the way that everyone does data analysis, right? It's very different. Uh, and the fact that you can have one language that kind of can suit everyone and we can all be in the same room together and sh have some shared notion of experience or whatever um, is kind of amazing, actually, I think. So. Thanks for the talk. Absolutely loved kind of the dialectical ideas. I think there's a lot of value in that perspective. Um, so I'm kind of uh, in the middle of your spectrum, going from recovering SaaS user back to developer, uh, the other end of the spectrum. So <clears throat> I was wondering if you had to predict the future and see kind of where would we be in 10 years for making that transition back successful. Uh, what's your best guess at what it would look like? For me, it's kind of uh, learning a lot of things in base. Um, do you feel like that's kind of where the loop is headed, or do you see kind of another path? You're asking me to predict the future? Yeah. <laughs> no problem. I'm on it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think ultimately, I think, uh, I mentioned the kind of, those kind of four things earlier on in terms of what might the future look like. Um, but that said, um, I think the, I mean, the question is going to be what are people going to need in the future? I have no idea. Um, I don't know, maybe the whole data science thing will fizzle out and you know, nobody will care or maybe we'll have robots doing all our programming and so nobody, so we won't need developer tools. Or, you know, I, who knows? I have, I, it's going to be really interesting, it's guaranteed, right? Um, and I think, I, and I think the issue is that when change happens, it's always a little bit uncomfortable and the thing that you valued um, is still valuable to you, but then the environment around you changes, right? Uh, and so it's, I don't know, I, I can't predict what's going to happen. I have no idea. But we've got to be ready to move with it, I think, is the only lesson to learn. We have time for two quick questions. Um, let's go here. And then Terry. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Making them work harder. <laughs> Um, I just want to pick up on that last point, uh, Roger. So I think uh, an experience that's been happening more generally in the world is, you know, uh, our reaction to, uh, is, let's say, new users coming into countries is, you know, this uh, sort of conservatism. And maybe we're seeing a similar thing in the R community where, you know, this influx of new users, there's a reaction, a conservative reaction from within the community. But we can't really afford to leave those people behind. Like we have to bring them along somehow. Um, and did you, do you have any idea about how we can do that like without excluding them? Well, I think uh, a lot has changed with the, our community since the, I mean, if you think about when R started, let's say, I don't know, ar arbitrarily say 1996 or so, I mean, the internet was like barely <laughs> just getting started, right? Uh, and so R is very much a product of the pre-internet kind of age. Um, and so I think there's been a lot of growing pains over this period largely due to that, um, that fact. Um, so I think the extent to which we have kind of sub-communities sub within, I mean, I think as the community gets more heterogeneous and uh, there may be some value to kind of segmenting it into kind of different interests. So there's people who do astronomy and then there's people who are work in industry and there's people who do other things. And I think they, there's been some self-organization along those lines and also especially with new platforms coming out like Slack groups and Twitter and whatever, our ladies. I think that kind of segmentation is quite useful. Um, uh, it's not unlike at my school where we teach introduction to biostatistics and we have a huge class. And so over time, now we have four classes called introduction to biostatistics because there's different people and there's different needs and the size of the class has grown and, um, and uh, we have to teach them in slightly different ways. So I think, um, so, so some segmentation like that early on is maybe good to kind of get people into a, a sub-community that they identify with. Um, and I think that has been happening now, and um, maybe it happened a little bit too late, but it's happening. Uh, and so I think that's a positive development. Um, I don't know if you've seen this morning, but the, the Python community is in a bit of turmoil with Guido stepping down as benevolent dictator. Uh -huh. Do you think that perhaps this tension, sort of back to Dirk's point, in this, yeah. this last question as well, this tension's actually helped us avoid having such a central point of failure in our community, and it might actually be a strength that we've got this, this dichotomy of things that we're trying to cover with the language? It means we're sort of resilient to failure. 
<laughs> uh, famous last words, right? Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think um, not having the so-called benevolent dictator model, I think, is, you know, like with Linux or, uh, or Python or, or other projects, may be good or bad. I don't know. I, uh, so it's, um, it depends on kind of what is needed in the future, I think, um, in terms of change or, or uh, kind of evolution. Uh, so I guess my answer to your question is I don't know. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So um, thank you all so much uh, for coming here today and thank you Roger, it's been a real great pleasure to get to